mentioned, I'm Stacy, and yep, I began my postdoc just over two months ago here um, at uh, Digital Futures, and I'm based at the Division of Urban and Regional Studies at KTH. So the subject of my presentation today, as Andy noted, um, and also my research, um, are the uh, digital transformations within our current pandemic, uh, sustainable smart cities to help enhance public well-being and the experience of the spaces that we share. My background uh, is in building architecture. And um, once again, as Andy pointed out, I did my PhD at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And so living and growing up in Australasia, and as you may be able to tell from the list of earthquakes in the center of my screen, um, that's uh, alongside uh, the archival building damage sketch drawings um, dating from an earthquake in 1848, the threats from natural disaster have underpinned the experience of everyday life for a very long time. And so in these ways inspired my interest in exploring both the risks and the responses to natural hazards within our towns and urban centers with the overall aim of generating safer streets and public spaces. Now, during my doctoral studies, I had the opportunity to use and examine the applications of geospatial technologies within multidisciplinary teams to inform the selection of specifically seismic retrofit or earthquake strengthening uh, design solutions for New Zealand's historic unreinforced masonry buildings. Now, a question um, that I often found myself being asked is, are there many historic buildings or much uh, architecture in New Zealand that requires such conservation treatment? And my answer essentially to this question has been short, being that whether we are dealing with buildings that are 100 years old or landscapes bearing several hundred years of settlement, there is more than one definition of what constitutes cultural heritage. And this is because our towns, urban centers and landscapes are not blank slates, but are instead evolving and being modified. And in doing so are adding new chapters to their histories through change and adaptation of what we refer to as their physical fabric, as well as their uses and ultimately their meanings to uh, local communities. So this premise informed my previous uh, uh, um, research and focused um, on architecture design uh, philosophies that, um, that featured or addressed the coming together of old and new construction technologies. So thinking about, for example, their compatibility, their reversibility and their authenticity um, as some core guiding principles for understanding the potential impacts on both the historic or the more recent existing building fabric um, and stock as well. So now having an opportunity to uh, explore cities as arenas of innovation, I've been, I've been quite excited to expand this thinking um, and reinterpret the overarching themes of public well-being, urban planning and design through this lens of digitalization or digital technologies during my postdoc. So essentially thinking about how the intersection of um, digital tech, public well-being and urban planning or design can help generate place-based responses that are really comprised of solutions that arise from specific social or cultural contexts and are therefore appropriate for specific populations. Therefore, today, I'd like to start by placing the smart urban technologies and infrastructures that respond to threats within our urban centers um, within or, or using a particular emphasis on the COVID-19 pandemic to start sort of unpacking the relationships between digital te um, tech and our spatial experiences within public or civic spaces. Mm -hmm. 
So I took this picture on screen um, during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 in central Sydney, Australia. As I started to reflect on the fact that the relationships between pandemics and our cities or urban centers is not new. Equally, I felt that, it, that it's now important to, um, well, acknowledge that today's smart technologies don't exist in a vacuum, but they form part of a longer historical lineage of urban pandemic responses that stretches from the ancient era through to the contemporary day. So with that, and bearing in mind the vast academic discourse that already exists on the history of urbanism and disease, I'll instead um, highlight specific examples that feature what I'll refer to as the physical built or analog design responses, followed by examples of emerging digitalization and observations from the present pandemic to start, uh, well, projecting forward to what I understand as speculative hybrid futures that are likely leaning towards a greater integration of digital technologies within our existing built urban fabric. So in other words, now many of us already know of the ancient and more contemporary disease plagues through stories, artwork, poetry, and for some of us, even the nursery rhymes that we grew up with. So instead, I'm proposing that we now view these events through the lens of urban design, through public well-being and digital technologies to start understanding both their current and their, uh, and their future social and spatial implications. So in brief and overall, my research involves three stages um, involving um, a desktop um, performance mapping of previous and ongoing urban pandemic responses and technologies in conjunction with undertaking uh, place-based uh, user studies to start understanding current experiences, both of which um, are intended to inform a participatory design phase with different groups of stakeholders. So today I'll, I'll um, be focusing primarily on the first two aspects. Starting with uh, the analog. Now at a glance, the historical record tells us that pandemics have persisted since the earliest times, beginning with the Athenian plague in 430 BC through to COVID-19 in the contemporary era. The events that we can see on the screen are by no means an exhaustive list, um, but are more intended to help generate a living timeline that in some cases feature recurrences or multiple outbreaks of some diseases. For example, Leprosy is believed to date from 2000 BC, but experienced a very significant uh, resurgence during the 11th century. So over the following slides, I'll aim to highlight the role of urban centers or the built environment, both as a cause, um, but also a core factor in disease transmission, also bearing in mind its capabilities in managing or responding to pandemics. Let's start with the ancient era, which is characterized by the formation of empires, along with burgeoning trade, war, religion, each of which contributed to the urban condition. We know that the Athenian plague took place in approximately between 430 to 427 BCE, spreading from sub-Saharan Africa through North Africa and eventually into Greece. Whereas the exact a uh, cause of the disease or the disease itself remains to be confirmed. Later artistic depictions and impressions present scenes of widespread suffering experienced by disease populations. And historians have suggested overcrowding and uh, unsafe waterways um, as a cause for this rampant spread. In fact, some of the most famous mythological and historical accounts of these periods speak of the vast impacts on humanity from Homer's epic, the Iliad, through to the famed history of the Peloponnesian War, stating that, quote, the sufferings of individuals, they seemed almost beyond the capacity of human nature to endure, end quote. In 165 AD, 
the Antonine Plague, consisting of smallpox, surfaced in Rome as a result of increased trading, particularly along the Silk Road. And I found it interesting that the, the, the drawbacks of urbanism were observed this early on, but also that the physical remains of dedicated hospitals um, start to become evident. Overall, reflected in the statement on screen and acknowledging that, quote, Rome's empire, the Roman army, the extent of the empire, the trade networks, the size and number of Roman cities ultimately form the basis for uh, devastating disease transmission, end quote. The Justinian plague of circa 541 to 542 CE is believed to be the first appearance of the bubonic, the pneumonic, and the septicemic plagues, spread by pests and further driven by trade and war, eventually resulting in approximately 25 to 50 million deaths. So along with a number of believed remedies and treatments that range from cold baths through to powders and magical amulets, early hospitals and methods of quarantine can also seem, be seen to emerge during this period. Now, probably one of the most well-known diseases that has endured to the current day is Hansen's disease, also known as leprosy, spread through the mobility of people. And here, I think it's interesting to pause and reflect um, on the physical or the analog responses to this disease, which assume the form of dedicated built leprosy hospitals, also known as leprosaria, sometimes referred to as leper colonies that were constructed. In particular, we're thinking about the social implications brought about by built institutional responses to disability that would go on to shape the approaches and the views of future generations. So to highlight an example as an architectural manifestation of the social context, here's an image of the chapel of St. Mary Magdalene built in the 12th century to accompany a hospital for those with leprosy and also demonstrated by St. Nicholas's Hospital and its associated church within a precinct of associated buildings. Moving through to the uh, medieval era where exploration and globalization shaped both pandemics and society's responses to them. The vast overseas trade routes and the uh, traditions of transoceanic voyaging, in fact, led to a phenomenon known as biological globalization, also known as the Columbian Exchange, that was responsible for redistributing disease, plants, and animals in new territories. Also during this period, we see um, a specific rise in the use of um, a 40-day quarantine, which of course served as a forerunner of the modern day counterpart that we now um, are, well, have become very used to viewing and experiencing in the present day. As we know, one of the worst disease outbreaks of all time is the Great Pestilence or the Black Death consisting of the bubonic plague, which traveled along caravan routes and via trading ships when approximately a third of the global population lost their lives. And I think that well, medieval artistic depictions like the one on screen pretty powerfully capture the distress and the scale of human suffering as they struggle to inter, to, um, inter large volumes of their dead. And of course, these scenes are playing out today as well across our phones, laptops, and TV screens, for example, as well. The same themes of uh, exploration and globalization also accompany us into the early modern era. And during this period, the Great Plague of London of 1665 that uh, consisted of the bubonic plague began in an overcrowded church, St. Giles in the field, and subsequently spread through parishes and households, again, where the scale of suffering comes through in many representations of 
urban conditions in London. Whether we are looking at whole families in the home and urban populations in the streets or the city at large. Now the social spatial implications of this deadly outbreak, for example, are evident in many ways, including the fact that during this time, wealthy families, um, including doctors and the monarchy could in fact um, afford to flee this urban center. However, much of the working population could not, and therefore were amongst some of the most vulnerable. During this period, trade ceased, and the Council of Scotland also declared that its border with England was to be closed. The late modern era was characterized by the context of globalization and colonization that gave rise to new urban conditions. Now, the first cholera pandemic also spread through infected water and traveling military troops but was significant in leading to the design of a new urban drainage system and sewers reflected by a quote that I think is quite telling of these shifts in societal thinking. Being that quote, to store the filth of the city within the city is simply to invite disease and death, end quote. Now, in essence, London has previously relied on night soil, uh, 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 groups whose task it was to essentially empty local cesspits, whilst their rivers were turned into open sewers and the rise of the flush toilet, for example, only made the problems worse as feces were released into the River Thames, which in turn was also used to provide water for drinking and washing. So with that, welcome to the technology of modern urban sewer networks designed by Sir Joseph Baselgate. And I briefly note here that there are, of course, forerunners and precedents for public urban sanitation systems that were developed and constructed in the ancient world. But at this point, um, I will focus specifically on a key example from the late modern era. Bearing that in mind, the network itself um, was made up of an underground grid connecting the individual municipal drains along with the construction of the new Victoria Chelsea and Albert embankments to house the intercepting sewers. Also using Portland cement, which itself was a somewhat new but highly durable building material. And historians have cited these improvements as being responsible for preventing further outbreaks or major outbreaks of cholera in London. Though it should be noted that uh, Baselgate's um, uh, scheme, in fact, involved releasing the sewage approximately eight miles downstream into the Thames estuary. So simply further down the pipeline, so to speak. But shifting global regions to 19th century Australasia, the impacts of urban disease outbreak indeed were making their way to remote unexposed populations. And this was made especially clear during the Fiji measles pandemic in 1875. In brief, approximately one year earlier in 1874, Fiji was annexed as a British colony after which a royal party visited the islands in the South Pacific Ocean. Now the ship carrying the royal party included three Fijians who had contracted the disease in Sydney, Australia and subsequently spread it among the, lo the, the local Fijian population. Once again, here I think it's important to acknowledge that the same risks of passing disease to vulnerable and relatively geographically remote populations is a major concern during the current COVID-19 pandemic as well. But pausing from the historical record as well for a moment, um, but keeping with the theme of transmission of urban disease beyond the urban center, I could not help but recall news stories like the one on the screen describing this phenomenon of fleeing urban centers or cities by those segments of the population who can afford to do so. And I think captured by the quote on the screen acknowledging the impacts and the social consciousness around being around other human beings and therefore the risks posed by urban density 
in general today. Now on to the 20th century, where urban responses to pandemics were informed by continued globalization and increased urbanization. Probably the most cited examples are of course the waves of influenza or the flu over 1918 to 1919, where urban residents identify the risk of transmission as being driven by warfare and rapidly growing urban centers. Historian Nancy Toombs reflects on the social links between mass transportation, mass warfare, and mass media with the rapid spread of infectious diseases as she cites the physician George Price who was writing during 1918 itself. But historical uh, posters and materials like the image on screen also show us that a combination of urban responses was being implemented that included quarantine, public meeting bans, and general shutdowns of public life. In addition, existing buildings were converted for use as makeshift treatment centers, and I was interested to find resources revealing the, the mobilization of multiple private and municipal medical facilities and agencies to manage outbreaks are taking place on an urban scale as large field hospitals, for example. But once again, I think parallels can be drawn with our present day where indoor sports stadiums, for example, are also being adapted for use as temporary hospitals and now shared across the various um, digital news and social media platforms 100 years later. Here, I will briefly step beyond the timeline of major historical pandemics again to acknowledge um, another contemporary architecture project that is viewed as very significant and influential precedent for healthcare and well-being design. So that is um, being built in 1933, the Pimeo Sanatorium that's located west of Helsinki was designed by, by Alba and Aino Alto for isolating patients diagnosed with TB and featured construction technologies um, that were new and innovative during this time, including um, the use of reinforced concrete and steel to enable the use of cleaning, along with building massing forms, which allowed um, maximal sunlight penetration and buildings which were essentially detailed down to the form of their individual hospital chairs, known more commonly as the Pibio chairs, which were designed to be angled to aid patient breathing. And overall, Alto designed his, or, or described his design philosophy as being based on the idea of building as a medical instrument. That brings us now to an interesting overlap of analog and um, digital responses through emerging technologies during the latter uh, 20th century, where architectural and urban historians um, have posed the question of whether the significant advances in various digital technologies and tools have accordingly corresponded to proportional decreases in public vulnerability to disasters such as pandemics. So academic discourse and studies in the recent two to three decades highlight the uses of digital tools in managing HIV care, such as electronic monitoring systems that have increasingly been adopted since the 1980s. But let's keep moving and transition rapidly to the 21st century. In 2003, the severe, um, uh, acute respiratory syndrome, also known as SARS, presented yet another threat of the pandemic. But the use of digital tools ranged from online forms or logs, such as monitoring programs, smartphone uh, recording of symptoms, along with wearables and alert services, or tracking systems, which also drove evolving fields of research, being e-health, for example. One of the earliest occurrences of the Zika virus was in 1952, prior to its resurgence in 2007, 
a few years ago in 2013 and then again in 2015. Now, recent partnerships with Google Earth have since produced open source information sharing platforms with georeference models and featuring real time mapping using social media platforms, along with sensors, drones, and specialist mosquito traps, for instance. Hence, I think demonstrating or starting to demonstrate the spatial applications of IoT technologies. In 2009, management of the H1N1 swine flu also took place through a free online tracking system, along with personalized iPhone apps where early design challenges, such as time lags in the received and confirmed reports or information appeared and needed to be addressed, but also used in conjunction with informatics programs. The Ebola virus emerged as early as 1976, and again in 2014 and 2018. But this time, the uh, digital urban responses included tools and technologies for remote detection and long-term monitoring using global data sharing platforms. Again, utilizing IoT, cloud computing, as well as wearable devices. And that brings us to the present day and the COVID-19 pandemic, which itself was driven or is being driven by rapid urbanization, population growth and global travel. Now, the present discourse identifies not just the adoption of certain digital technologies, but an overall shift in urban lifestyles that is being made possible through the provision of various digital services that have enabled, for example, improved sensing, um, and access to public services informed by the overall aims of enhancing urban resilience and, and adaptability. Now, in the current um, scene and scenario, the first observation that I'll highlight is that a combination of disease outbreaks measures are currently being used, being both physical distancing, self-isolation and quarantine, but also aided by a growing digital ecology of tools. So as I realize that there is a large and dynamic network of technologies um, being used to manage the current pandemic, and that can be classified in many different ways, depending on research discipline and perspective. Over the next few slides, I will acknowledge these networks and their applications using their overall urban applications as key themes. So starting with urban monitoring through tracking and identification of disease spread commonly takes place through geospatial maps and data dashboards, along with surveillance systems such as biometric wearables, wastewater based epidemiology, thermal cameras and smartphone apps, such as those developed um, and that have been rolled out across um, many different countries, but both of which um, can have both tangible and intangible impacts on the extent of our access to public spaces and facilities during the pandemic and as we transition to hopefully a less restricted future. So overall here, we are thinking about the applications of urban surveillance in managing both how public spaces and facilities are used but also um, in tracking and managing possible outbreaks afterwards through, for example, digital contact tracing. Um, and so also important are the ways in which many of these technologies are in fact using existing urban infrastructures, such as mobile networks and various sensor networks um, for managing um, potential disease outbreak. But there's also a growing discourse um, on the impacts of urban public freedoms, namely the access to public data, the, um, along with the uh, consent to do so, and whether this consent might in fact be linked to the level of access to public services and spaces in the future as well. Similarly, the recording and visualization applications of digital technologies are often used to help slow or halt urban transmission as we know. 
also managed through the use of geospatial maps and dashboards with surveillance systems, but can also be aided by the adoption of virtual healthcare services. Um, but in general, um, overall digital access to public services can, and, and as we've seen, has also helped reduce the disease transmission as well. But with these advantages also come drawbacks for certain segments of our society, giving rise to the notion of digital exclusion. Um, so in short, referring to those who may not have access to digital technologies or the skills to make the transition from physical to a more digital urban lifestyle during this period. And thirdly, we've also observed the rise of the so-called infodemic, driven by the rapid spread of incorrect information. And in other words, where accurate and up-to-date data and guidance needs to be uh, disseminated to large urban populations. So hence requiring new forms of cyber governance. But again, now with the focus on, on, on specifically understanding those who may not have access to these tools or the skills to use them. Now at this stage, I realized that a key question that may come to mind is, well, what are the implications for these technologies and architecture or urban design as we move forward? Um, in other words, what's the relationship between the many uh, digital tools that have emerged and urban planning or design? So, Thinking about these ideas from a built environment perspective, the, the, the slide on screen take, well, aims to take an architecture history lens in understanding the roles played by urban centers in exacerbating, but as well as responding to the threats posed by disease outbreak. So if we look at some broad historical eras, a few patterns or observations can be made starting with the fact that we see that devoted field hospitals were set up to treat patients in the ancient era when the practice of physical distancing, quarantine or isolation also emerged. The drawbacks and the dangers of um, uh, ancient and the more historical urban living conditions were in fact mirrored during the Great Plague of London when segments of urban populations went as far as to abandon their cities in favor of safer rural um, lifestyles. And this of course was a privilege that was, that was available and that is available to a select few even during today's COVID-19 pandemic. A significant step forward came in the 19th century through widespread institutional design and building of urban sewers and drainage systems that I feel represented an important public infrastructure project in safeguarding or, or protecting both, both or all three being individuals, households and urban populations from pandemics. But what's of most interest and relevance to, to my project and what I think presents a big philosophical and design shift is the emergence of different digital technology applications during the latter 20th and early 21st centuries, where these tools begin to be integrated within our existing physical urban centers and building architecture. Examples, of course, being IoT, big data, and AI. But overall, we see a transition from analog to digital technologies, but also a combination of approaches in managing pandemics. So drawing from these ideas, the specific aspect that interests me are the ways in which urban responses to pandemics have been multifaceted, seen through their proposal and implementation, specifically um, in how populations are affected in both tangible and intangible ways, um, and especially as we move forward um, through an increasing use of digital technologies. But to further explore these questions, let's now catch up with real time and refer to a stage of the COVID-19 pandemic where some populations are casting their eye to speculative futures. 
Now, emptier streets and public spaces have characterized the urban experience over the past year. With increasing numbers of vaccinated populations also comes the various deliberations focused on the transition from our current urban restrictions. And we find ourselves asking questions such as, will, these, will streets like these fill once again with the many activities that define urban life? If so, how will this take place and when, most importantly? So, the, so many of the words that make up our everyday vocabulary, in fact, have spatial implications. Whether we are referring to the seemingly non-existent physical boundaries of a pandemic and the very tangible physical restrictions of personal and public movement that have been um, encapsulated by the terms lockdown, uh, self-isolation, social distancing, and so on. But how will these words translate as we transition? How could digital technologies complement analog approaches? What are and how do we address the many irreversible impacts of pandemic digital technology applications within our urban centers or spaces? So words like social distancing, self-isolation, quarantine, lockdown, um, and the many technologies that we've uh, worked through over the past few slides also bear a temporal aspect, referencing a time scale or often overlapping phases of pandemic disease outbreak. And many of which, as we know, have been aided and complemented by different digital tools. So the slide returns to the urban responses highlighted a few minutes ago by placing these approaches within a disaster risk reduction framework consisting of preparedness that corresponds to, uh, that, that can correspond to urban monitoring, along with the response phase that involves urban monitoring, tracking identification, along with recording and visualizing um, the current status, along with recovery, which involves all three of the previous phases, along with halting urban transmission, and lastly, adapting, which, um, or during when the ongoing uh, sharing of accurate and update and, and up to date information is crucial. But taking a step back, the efficacy of such technologies and frameworks relies on the extent of adoption by the populations they are intended for. So highlighting the relationship between techno or human-centered approaches that is being discussed within uh, current academic discourse and observed across the globe. Uh, the transdisciplinary intersections between uh, digital technologies, public well-being and urban planning or design provides a framework or can provide a framework of reference for examining existing literature to both um, compare and contrast the performance of these approaches. Now in conjunction and also informing this line of inquiry within my research will be to devise and undertake place-based user studies for a combination of observational research methods and potentially stakeholder interviews to understand um, the local experiences and specifically any changing uses of public spaces along with the management and the retention of urban freedoms in relation to the current and prospective uses of digital technologies to help support these transitions to a less restricted future. And of course, um, beginning by understanding some of the physical manifestations of the COVID-19 pandemic and their tangible impacts on the use of public spaces, whether they be the stickers on the ground we see on screen reminding us to maintain an appropriate physical distance along with signs on storefront doors uh, with, the with the recommended number of customers or patrons. And of course, the perspex screens that separate groups or customers from store or frontline workers. I'm interested in uh, exploring the 
diverse experiences across a range of urban space typologies as well that are usually characterized by large volumes of people and activity being urban or civic gathering spaces, um, specifically thinking about the role of public squares along with indoor public facilities, but also the street that can serve as an interstitial space or a threshold between both public and private life to start understanding the range of, of, of urban public vulnerabilities that, um, that are being experienced during this period. And also informing this thinking, um, a burgeoning area of discourse that I am currently exploring is on architecture with human computer interaction or HCI, um, and specifically thinking about the benefits, the challenges and the future pathways for what's termed the quote spatial or, or what might be a spatial temporally immersive environment. Now, recent developments in the scope from human computer interaction to human building interaction is also relevant in shifting the scale from human interaction through objects or artifacts um, to interaction within a dynamic architectural interface where information technologies are embedded in the built environment and therefore concerned with the advantages as well as the ethical consequences for the, uh, for, for the wider ur urban population who will who would be using these buildings and by default these technologies as well. And lastly, looking at the use of urban beds and excuse me, urban test beds and uh, participatory design to use the observations from my earlier desktop mapping um, and user study phases to, to explore alternative frameworks or approaches for urban pandemic digital tools that are inspired by local socio-spatial contexts and needs. So at that, in summary, um, a few broad takeaways um, are that, well, urban history from the ancient era through to contemporary times reveals an evolving timeline of public responses to pandemics. We see urban centers or cities sitting at the core of urban pandemic risk and response. We realize that vulnerability is not equally spread across urban populations, but we are now angling towards a more sort of complementary pandemic urban digital strategy as opposed to the outright adoption of a single approach. And that would hopefully be informed by the multi-dimensional uh, and socio-spatial implications of a hybrid architecture or urban fabric. And so I'd like to conclude with one of my, my favorite descriptions of vibrant urban life through, through the ages, um, where the historian Ben Schrader acknowledges that, quote, the street was the living room of everyday city life, end quote. And I understand that our challenges are now centered on using the tools and technologies at our disposal to regenerate and revitalize the space and the urban condition. Thanks very much everyone for your attention.